Okay, let's talk about food. It's always important to eat food that's rich in B12 to prevent a deficiency. So anything animal is going to have vitamin B12. Now one thing that's not on this picture list is dairy. Dairy foods are also um, good B12 sources in the diet as well, provided you're not allergic to dairy, provided the type of dairy that you're eating is not you know, the, the type of dairy, what we call A1 dairy, don't recommend A1 dairy, is a no-no. Um, so more so A2 dairy um, and organic grass-fed as well because otherwise you get all the chemicals and you get the unhealthy animal milk and you can't, you know, take milk from an unhealthy animal and drink it and expect it to be good for you. Now, so food, that's easy to eat B12, easy to eat it. Unless you're vegetarian or vegan, in which case I highly recommend you supplement with it. It's no judgment of me to tell you how you need to do your diet, but if you're gonna, if you're gonna be adamant about following a plant-based diet, you also need to be adamant about having your vitamin, B, vitamin B12 levels checked on a regular basis. Now, following up on that, one of the questions that most commonly gets asked of vitamin B12 is what's the best? Dr. Osborne, what's the best way to take it? So if you're supplementing, um, there's three ways that you can get vitamin B12 through supplementation. The first is through oral supplementation. So that would be like this pill right here, right? That pill that has or contains some type of vitamin B12. And the second way would be something called sublingual. Now sublingual, typically these are lozenges. These are little lozenges you put under your tongue and you suck on them like a piece of candy and they dissolve and the vitamin B12 absorbs into your, um, into your bloodstream through your cheeks. So remember we talked earlier about all the mechanisms, how you absorb vitamin B12, and it's predominantly a very specialized mechanism through your stomach and intestine, where well, you can bypass that whole thing with sublingual. Um, you, not so much with oral, but you definitely can with sublingual because if your stomach's broken and you go through your cheeks, it's, uh, it's still, you can still get it into your bloodstream. The third way is, is by an intramuscular injection. And so you see the needle here. So a lot of people will, will have their doctor either uh, inject them in the office or they'll take, the doctor will prescribe them an injectable to take home and use. Um, so this is kind of a synopsis of the advantages and disadvantages of these three types of uh, administration. So you can see with oral, you see advantages, the easiest and most convenient, no skills required. I don't think there's much skill required in swallowing a pill. You can do it yourself, it's painless, unless you choke on the pill. Um, but it's unsuitable for comatose patients and the patient uh, that doesn't eat or drink or severe patients with severe vomiting or diarrhea. And you see the sublingual advantages, rapid systemic impact, meaning it goes right in. Ease of administration, fewer side effects, and it's high bioavailability. Um, again, unsuitable for people who are in a coma and um, it, for the patient that doesn't eat or drink. I, I would argue that it's not really, I would even cross through this one. I don't agree with the authors of this because um, you might not eat or drink, but you can suck on a lozenge. It's not, that's not uh, so much what I would call a disadvantage. Then you have the intramuscular, which is rapid onset, uniform drug absorption, effective in an emergency, homologous absorption, Yet disadvantages are, you know, if you fear needles, there's, it's painful, requires an aseptic condition, meaning uh, if that needle gets contaminated, you could, you could infect yourself. Uh, muscle bulk may affect uh, the, the administration. So if you've got a lot of muscle tissue, if you're really well muscled, it can be harder for that intramuscular injection to disperse equally. And that also that injection can damage nerves and create paresis. Uh, or numbness and tingling as it, as it damages the nerve. So these are just some of the risks involved with, with, it, you know, with these intramuscular injections. My favorite is the sublingual. The sublingual, number two, hands down, is my favorite, and here's why. Um, most people with B12 common deficiencies, most people with the B12 deficiencies have GI damage, especially when they first come see me. There's almost always a, a, a GI damage as a result of gluten or some other food that they're consuming that's reduced their ability to absorb B12. And so I like the sublingual because when they have pre-existing GI inflammation or, or GI damage, 
we can go and bypass that damage and absorb directly through the cheeks. And it's not more expensive. It's not more hard to take. It's actually quite, quite, um, quite simple. And if you look at the sum, so I have seen clinically, this is more effective than anything else. That's just my opinion, even, even my opinion more so here, because I've had a lot of people who were doing this decide to not do this anymore because the B12 sublinguals were working so effectively. But this is a summary of 13 studies. So what the authors of this of this paper come out with is, is they analyzed 13 studies in the literature that were comparing um, these three mechanisms of vitamin B12. And so these were all taken from um, randomized clinical trials in humans. And what they found is that you see down here, there were a total of 40, 000, or 4,275 patients with vitamin B12 deficiency were included in the final analysis. We found that irrespective of the route of vitamin B12 administration, serum vitamin B12 levels were increased. When comparing the, difference, the different routes, the top ranked route for increasing levels of B12 was intramuscular route, followed by the sublingual route. However, this difference has no clinical significance. In other words, they found a slight uh, win with intramuscular, but it wasn't clinically significant. So sublingual uh, being basically, for all intents and purposes, just as effective. So if you're, if you're you know, on the fence about these routes, you know, my opinion is that in clinical experience is that number two is fine. It, it'll correct those of you that have that GI damage. It'll still correct the deficiency uh, perfectly fine um, without the need to have to jab yourself with a needle on a regular basis. And to me, that's a far easier proposition.